you too how's everyone doing jags to riches james peters thank you all so much for your time that's it ladies and gentlemen that is a wrap on the 2021 2022 nba season what an absolute blast it has been i mean an incredible season obviously as a celtics fan an incredible run but i mean honestly this is just going to be a quick reflection video briefly spend a few moments talking about the season nothing to you know not a deep dive or anything like that just more so a raw fans you know reaction and reflection to the team and then more so looking at the off season you know kind of previewing that again nothing too crazy um we'll do separate videos where we go into full breakdowns on individual players performances kind of like you know a review of each player a tatum video a smart video etc but first i mean what's crazy to me is you don't realize it when you're playing so damn deep into the season that i literally was looking up yesterday like shit when is free agency and draft and everything it's like that shit's this week the draft is in a few days and then free agency is like the following week it's crazy like when your team is on one of the playoff you know go on a finals run it's like as soon as that shit ends you're immediately getting geared up for the next season like it's i mean within two weeks of our season ending you're going to basically have a new drafted celtic maybe depending on what happens second rounder and then you'll have some players signing free agents you know you'll have players move it's just crazy to me to think that and then shit, it's about to be july when's the season start in october so not a very long off season you're talking about several months and um you know we'll be um ready to rock and roll but obviously looking back at this past season 51 wins 31 losses good for the number two seed and if we're being honest it was with the exception to maybe that 2018 playoff run you know when tatum was a rookie and it was just all those young boys going on that game seven run i think in, in maybe the some of that that it 30 point per game but i would say that this might be my fondest and just my i would say the funnest memory i have over the brad stevens era as a celtics fan it was just and he gave us a lot of great ones especially early on when we had those you know teams that were just like you know the underdogs going on playoff runs and geared up by this young coach you know it was just that, that was a fun time but uh this year was special i mean it it really was because it just the way it came about from it's you know the danny ainge the disappointing end to last year and then obviously the Danny Ainge and Brad Stevens moves and then all the just the reshaping of the roster, sending out all stars like Kimba and bringing back Horford and signing Schroeder and just all of the moves that happen. And then for the, it to be a shitty start, you know, hashtag fire email, break up the Jays. Marcus Smart can't be a point guard. Why did y'all give Rob Williams this injury prone guy that four year, you know, contract? Grant Williams cut him. I mean, it's just it was one of those just. We were below 500. Uh, I, I remember the month of December was a brutal schedule for us. And we even talked about it multiple times in November, like, hey, we're probably gonna get our asses kicked in December. Didn't change the fact that when it actually did happen, it was you know a lot of panic. We did finish off the year 2021 being strong with a victory over Phoenix. And then that was kind of like where the tides, I, I still think we were 17 and 19 at that time. But that's when it started to change the month of january we would pretty much battle throughout that month trying to get back to 500 and stay above 500 and i believe right at the end of that month is when we achieved that we got to i want to say 25 and 25 off the top of my head and then we never looked back and we really we got healthy we started going on those 10 game win streaks lose a game and then another 10 game it was just it was a point where i think we won like 23 out of 20 six or seven it was it was wild you started to lose count um how many times we held teams under 100 points you know the just ascension to the number one overall defense i, I mean it was the basically the number one starting five uh, when it, these are a lot of advanced stats but then obviously jason tatum and his ascension into superstardom top 10 you know securing that especially in the month of march three-time player of the week you know jalen brown i mean just everything that this team did to dispel all the bullshit that they had been dealing with 
you know, at the beginning of the season and for it to really happen like that. I remember saying at one point it was like this season is going to be one of two things. It's either going to show that we made a lot of wrong moves or that the reason we had a rough start was because it was a brand new system being implemented and they had to learn it. It just took time. And that's obviously what it was, you know, because by, like I said, the second half of the season, we were the best team or right up there with Phoenix as the best team in the NBA. So incredible end to the regular season. We obviously didn't tank. We went for while, you know, went for um, the number two seed while teams like the Bucks and Sixers kind of, you know, took the foot off the gas. We secured number two, even though we had the exact same record as number three Bucks, number four Philly. Swept the Nets. In the first round, the number seven seed Nets, who a lot of people were, you know, oh, my God, that, that, that. Katie, Kyrie, you know, I think Katie's right up there. Number two, maybe three in the entire world, best players. And obviously that set up a round two instant classic with the Bucks, where we had ended up beating them in seven. And because we had that home court advantage, game seven was played in Boston. Same, same thing with Miami, seven game battle ended up beating them in game seven in Miami. And then unfortunately we fell short to Golden State in six. Congratulations to the Golden State Warriors. Um, Well-earned, well-deserved uh, because of, I, I will say that the Boston Celtics, I mean, we, that team is not a joke. Excellent defensively led by, you know, two of the brightest stars, you know, in the sport today, you know, as far as just being 24, 25, and just their path forward is, it really is, you know, beautiful and incredible to watch, you know, the strides that Jalen and Jason have taken each year, obviously Jason into what is now a superstar and then Jalen to an all-star. I mean, it's just, it really is. That's a tough team, well-coached, and um, we're on a hell of a run. So Golden State just showed, you know, levels to this, the championship pedigree that they've had four out of the last eight, six out of the last eight, they've actually been to. I mean, Steph Curry, arguably the greatest point guard of all time, you know, right up there with, I'd say, you know, MJ, uh, Magic Man. But uh, again, no shame in losing to them. I thought Stephen A. Smith, again, who I thought was brilliant throughout this finals, uh, said it best. He said, I think that the Celtics beat any other team except for Golden State, just based off of their experience and the fact that a lot of the things, the Celtics beating themselves plays right into the Golden State strength. So when we go and have 18 turnovers, you know, they go and have 30 something points off those turnovers. You know, when we miss 10 free throws and then only lose by 10, I mean, things like that. So obviously Steph Curry was on God mode, finals MVP, Magic Johnson MVP, uh, well-deserved, well-earned. Like I said, um, the, some of the lack of adjustments on him. I mean, this was a learning experience, right? I am so damn proud of my team. I can hold my head as high as I want because, as I said in my last video, imagine criticizing the two teams that are playing in the finals. Like, what? This is the best team in the East, the best team in the West, and they're battling. I, I mean... I have nothing but great things to say. I am so proud of them. And I even coming into this season when I made the I think they're going to finish in the top four prediction. And that seemed a lot of people laughed at me for that or back in what early March when I said, I think the Celtics are going to the finals. People thought that was crazy. And for us still to actually, you know, to make it there, like my man, Jack Bienvenue, tattoo guy, shout out to him, man. Um, back in March, also getting that tattoo. But for it to just seem like such a far-fetched, no shot in hell chance of happening. But then it's like we actually make the finals. We are inching closer and closer. And then to achieve it, to actually go on this run, it was special. It was beautiful. And again, I am proud to be a Celtics fan. I'm proud of this team. And the the um, the future is extremely, extremely bright. But again, um, nothing but love and respect to the golden state warriors and steph curry he's one of my favorite of all time i was i think in high school i was like a freshman when he was at davidson like going on his run so i've been there with him every step of the way uh same with clay thompson i love him so no shame um no sting to the pride just a little disappointed because obviously when you're two games away and because if you look i mean that game four when you have an opportunity to go up three one you're at home and you again we, we can get into you know the game four and game five 
Shit, even game six, Tatum's only scoring two in the second half. But at this point, it, it's kind of irrelevant. It is what it is. But uh, looking at this upcoming offseason, man, that's what this is basically about. So, again, I mentioned the draft. It's That's pretty simple. You know, no first-round picks unless we trade back in, which I don't see why we would do that. We have a second. It'll probably be the same thing as last season when we drafted, you know, Johan Bergeron out of France and basically sent him back over there to develop. You know, we've got Johan, um, Yamadar. We've got some of those European players, overseas players over there developing. And um, you may see something similar, or you may see a player get drafted, go to the, you know, maybe the Sam Hauser route, two-way G League, something along those lines. I would be very surprised, even though they do, they are out there. There's plenty of second rounders out there. Shit, we were just talking about IT a minute ago that, you know, can come in and make a difference but to expect that as a, a rookie you know long shot so not too much to be invested in this upcoming thursday it's always cool to see draft because of trades speaking of that you've just seen freaking christian wood uh get traded to dallas and if you know me you follow these channels um you know i love me some christian wood just because he's one of those guys like you know everyone has those group of players where you have been on their their side the whole time gassing them up and then they finally end up booming and, you know, you get to go back to some of the other people and see, see Jalen Brown, Marcus Smart, Terry Rozier, Christian Wood are some of mine. And uh, Christian Wood was one of those guys I started watching because I heard Danny Ainge was looking at him uh, when he was with Detroit. But that trade, I think they wanted a first and Danny was like, hell no. But uh, I started paying attention because that's when Drummond got traded and he took off. And ever since then, and then when he got traded to Houston, basically a 20 and 10 player while shooting 39 percent. So. I would have loved that. So seeing, you know, draft day trades are kind of true, are, are always cool. But for the Celtics, it's more so about the following week and free agency. Now, you're always going to hear Bradley Beal, Zach Levine, and, you know, that. listen, guys, we do not have that type of money. We cannot sign those type of players. Yeah, I mean, that's just, that is not realistic. If you want to trade, sign and trade, I mean, and that's another thing people got to remember is in order to get some of those players, we have to send out, you know, quite a significant amount because, again, these are max players. They're making over 30 million. That means we would have just sending out Smart and Derek White would match one of their salaries, probably right around 34, 36 million. So always keep that in mind. So when it comes to free agency, I'm thinking we'll be looking more at that mid levels we do have some tpes out there still 17 million 10 million things along those lines those get interesting um but i think that some of the players you're going to see come in and first let's talk about needs i think that obviously shooting is always going to be a big need uh so wings depth so shooting wings playmaking front court just depth in general right that is the needs of this team. So I think right off the bat, a hometown boy, Pat Connington, champion with the Milwaukee Bucks, guy that comes off the bench, 25, 26 minute, can average 10 points, one of the best three-point shooters in the game. Um, and like I said, he's a vet with championship experience. I honestly think that if I had to put money down, he's who I put money down that is going to be in Celtics green next year. So I expect Pat Connington to be here. And then I think we're going to look at patty mills or bryn forbes as a backup point guard i don't know if patty mills is going to opt out it's a player option with the nets i don't see why he'd want to stay there and if he does i think that if he opts out i think he has a good chance he ends up in boston based on his relationship with both Ime adoka and Derek white let's not forget you know him and Derek white basically played side by side in san antonio for years so i could easily see that and again both connington patty mills those are guys that are affordable you know they would be probably willing to accept somewhere in that 10 to 12 maybe one of those you know vet like i said i think that instead of saying like the 30 million dollar deals of the world these are players that are more realistic um who else if patty opts in i think maybe a bryn forbes um is another one that's very realistic he's one of those guys that you know obviously another one he's a champ you know with the milwaukee bucks and the reason he He's a, a point guard, 6'2", six, 6'3", six, kind of a combo guard, but he's a lights-out shooter, 40-plus percent career, and he actually won a championship with Pat Connington in Milwaukee and played with Ime Hidoka and Derek White in San Antonio for years. So, again, 
let's say they brought in Pat Connington and Bryn Forbes. You just brought in two guys that won a championship together that are both 40% three-point shooters and have both played with Derek White in San Antonio being coached, or not both, but Bryn Forbes played with Derek White in San Antonio being coached by Ime Adoka. And those are going to be the guys all coming off the bench together. So you're bringing in Bryn Forbes, Derek White, Pat Connington, all three. I mean, you kind of see where I'm going with that. So those are some of the players I think are very realistic. Um, some of the other guys to keep your eye on, um, Kyle Anderson from Memphis, that would be, these are maybe like more home runs. Like if these would be bigger deals, like if we could get some of these guys, like when I say bigger deals, not financially, I'm talking about just like, holy shit, that's a great signing. Um, Kyle Anderson, TJ Warren, maybe on a prove it deal, who knows? Um, Toreen Prince, Rob Covington, um, Nicholas Batum, some three and D wings. Montrez Harrell, some front court depth. I mean, because right now you've got basically Rob Williams, Al Horford, Daniel Tice. However, at the end of this year, Al Horford's contract's up. He's also going to be 37 years old. So it kind of gets interesting. You know what I mean? So maybe they look to bring in like a Montrez Harrell, Thaddeus Young, Mo Bamba, uh, Jalen Smith, one of those type guys that could, you know, compete for the number three ish, you know, with Daniel Tice. And not to mention, maybe bringing in some size, you know, that's something we have truly lacked, you know, is just having that true, you know, 6'10", 6'11", 7 footer that can, you know, 260, 270, that can actually come in and bang, you know what I mean? Now, obviously, Jalen Smith, Mo Bama, guys like that, Robin Lopez, they fit that, but Montrez Harrell, you know, you know what he gives you, a spark plug off the bench, that young of that, but um, some other home run guys, I would really like, if we could get, like, that would be, Malik Monk is probably my number one. Um, I've been reading that he could potentially be looking at accepting a mid-level. And it's just like, if you can get a guy like him, who could be that starter or coming off the bench spark plug scorer, who just averaged 15 a game in, you know, the Lakers, who balled out in Charlotte. Um, I think that would be a home run. I also like Otto Porter Jr., who just obviously won, you know, championship with Golden State. I've heard Gary Harris, you know, out of Orlando. So, I mean, there, there are a few interesting guys, you know what I mean? But to me, like I said, it, it's a very clear path because this free agency is not the one as interesting as the following one for me because the following one, what happens? Al Horford's $27 million is coming off of the books, right? And that is the same year where a bunch, the pool is a lot more open as far as targets of that 20 to 30 million dollar range um so and this is kind of how i see it happening like i said i expect like a pat connington um maybe a playmaker maybe they target like a, a ricky rubio some some sort of you know additional playmaker pat connington additional playmaker and maybe some front court depth so i'll say pat connington Bryn forbes and whatever you know player x and then I think the trade deadline is when it gets a little interesting. Speaking on the trades, obviously we're always going to be in the rumors. I think that we'll finally get away from the Jalen and break up the Jays. Marcus might even, you know, be toned down a little bit more, but expect that to be filled by Derek White and Grant Williams this year. Those will be the guys involved in every trade rumor, simply because Derek White's making about 18 million a year. His value is extremely high right now after coming off this run. You could argue it may not get any higher than it is. And then Grant, same thing, you know, very affordable contract. Even when you extend him, it probably only it'd be probably for less than 15 million a year. And he's one of the better three and D young up and coming, you know, wings in the game. He can play small ball in the front court, but is also, like I said, an elite, an elite three point shooter. Imagine saying that, especially from the corner. So, um, and if you put those two with maybe like a near knee Smith together, that's like a $30 million package so with some first, you know, you can get back a hell of a return. So when it comes to names that you'll hear, that's probably the main package that you're going to be hearing throughout this year. But I think that it's the trade deadline itself that gets interesting because obviously if a bunch of players are leaving next off season, if the teams know they're not returning trade deadline, you know, is when they're going to probably look to move some of them. And for me, that is when you're looking at like, um, you know, Larry Nance Jr., um, either one of the Bogdanoviches, Bohan or Bogdan, you know, from Utah or from Atlanta, guys like that. Uh, Jeremy Grant out of Detroit. Those are other guys. And 
to be clear, guy, I, I, I'm not completely against doing trades either, you know, but if I am trading, especially like a Grant Derek White type package, I want to be getting back Jeremy Grant or like a maybe even a John Collins, like, you know, that type of player. You know what I mean? Because I don't think that's the direction we necessarily need. I feel like we're obviously knocking on the door two wins away. And if you just play this out, sign Pat Connington and Patty Mills this offseason, right? And then let's say the trade deadline, maybe a Jeremy Grant or someone like that is like, I'm not coming back, Detroit. Detroit says, give us Grant Williams, you know, two first and whatever else to make the contracts work. Even if you don't go that route, well, then the the next offseason, you could be looking at just signing one of those guys. Maybe Al Horford's, you know, he's his contracts up god bless him but we would be so close to winning a title if not have won, won one already that he probably sticks around maybe on a one-year vet minimum now you can go sign a jeremy grant bogdanovich one of those type of guys to 2025 20, mil and then all of a sudden i mean do you kind of see where i'm going you have pat connington patty mills and then jeremy grant you sign those three in the course of this year without losing anything so multiple option guys you could consider going that way obviously there's risk to that injuries players being unhappy you never want to give away a year especially when you're already knocking on the door um i keep mentioning bogdanovich just because he's in utah with danny ainge obviously i think they're going to be breaking some shit up uh probably soon and i just think he's one of those guys that would fit you know perfectly with us he basically averages you know 18 19 20 points a game the last several years but is also a 40% lights out on five attempts, three point shooter, six, seven, six, eight can basically play the two through four. And I think it's affordable. I don't think we would break the bank, you know? So uh, again, guys, um, this is one of those things where rumor, the off season is gonna be all about rumors and trades and, you know, a bunch of just wild shit. And fortunately for us, I don't think it's that complicated. We're basically bringing back the same core, you know, the same, I mean, rotation for the, the same seven, basically, you know, our main seven with the Jays, Smart, Al, Rob, Derek, and Grant, you know, they're all basically coming right back. And you got Peyton and Tice in the eight and nine. So I do expect some splashes, like I said, like, you know, Pat Connington's and players like that. I expect those guys to come in and they will definitely make a hell of a difference on those, this team. Maybe it gets interesting. Maybe Brad does what he remember last year. Derek, Dennis Schroeder came out of left field out of nowhere. So who knows? Maybe he gets in a Toreen Prince or a Malik Monk or an Otto Porter, one of those guys where it's a or Kyle Anderson, a much bigger name and a guy that, you know, can definitely um, shit <laughs> potentially threaten, you know, grants at the seven spot and challenge Derek for the six man. You know, that's what we want. You know, we want a guy that can come in and challenge our six or seven man rotation. But um, um, pretty much that's it, guys, you know. What you'll pretty much see throughout this offseason from, you know, Celtics corner is, I mean, we don't got to really wait too much longer. I mean, we'll probably do a video around the draft later this week, next week, anytime, any free agent signings, you know, we'll obviously cover that. And then we're less than basically, what, 90 days away from, you know, summer league, training camp, preseason and, you know, season start. So uh, any big news that breaks, we'll obviously be all over it. And as the Celtic news continues to come in, we will continue to cover that. It has been an absolute incredible year, guys. I mean, and I'd say the best part, um, obviously the Celtic success, but it, it's been um, you all. It's, it's been meeting people. It's been my man, Bobby. It's been Bree Marie, you know, Jack Bienvenu, Rashid, Carlito, you know, Henry Progeny. Um, Godzilla Steve, 40 Cal, you know, easy. Uh, I mean, all the guests we've had on Anna Horford, you know, John Corrales, Bobby Manning, Ev Guy Boston, uh, Max Letterman, you know, Adam Taylor times two, you know what I mean? Um, there's so many Laney and I, I mean, I, I could all my men with the Celtics Reddit podcast, Celtics J and freaking Ben and Spoonie there. I couldn't, I, I'm, if I'm forgetting, forgive me, but, um, the people in the comments, the Landons, and um, just, you know, my man, um, Justin Chapman. And I mean, there's so many badass and the dialogue. And for someone like me in Florida, people down here don't want to hear shit about the Celtics, guys. It's all about the Miami Heat, Orlando Magic, Atlanta's a little bit north of me. 
they're not trying to hear about Boston. So to be able to come on here and just, you know, share my mind and opinions with you all and for you to give me the time of day is the greatest honor. And, you know, knocking on the door of 500 subs right now is surreal to me, you know. And if you look back at the beginning of the year, some of my early videos and just the journey that we've all, you know, with Celtics Corner, Bobby and myself and just, you know, how far we've come and what we've been able to accomplish together has been absolutely brilliant and beautiful. And I am honored again, guys. I'm honored to, you know, have this opportunity to meet you all, speak to you all and cheer on this amazing team with you all. Thank you again. I hope you have an incredible conclusion to your weekend, an incredible off season. If you haven't sub, please sub. Videos will be coming out weekly. We'll be covering any and anything, everything Celtics, Jags to Riches, James Peters. Thank you all so much for your time. Take care, guys.